Hey everyone, it's Joe Lyons here in Dallas, Texas. Yeah, and Jackie here from Copenhagen, Denmark. And um, in in so just because I, I think it is interesting and relevant, we were you know before we usually before we start the webinar, we we chit chat and discuss. So those of you who aren't don't attend the webinar, you're missing out on some fun you know interesting stuff. Although one part we were talking about just was VS Code and and having you know good solid editors um, in other tools, but but that is one way that can really speed up. Um, your, you know, your efficiency. Um, and the other one, which actually led to, I, th I thought, Jackie, and we'll have to discuss this, whether it makes more sense as a podcast or a webinar. But I, I remember for me years ago, when I worked at Corporate America, the whole doing what you just mentioned, working at home on, you know, and working at work on different computers, and finding ways to streamline that, right, and things that you can do that can really, really help you work on multiple, it maybe doesn't matter if it's work at home, but it's just multiple computers. Right, that, that's a fun topic, I think. Yeah. So welcome everyone. Um, this is our 54th Auto Hockey webinar. Um, I feel like I'm getting old just saying that. It, it's, it's a lot of webinars. Um, it is. And uh, let's go on here. So there's 74 registrants. You know, a lot of people, because this is a worldwide thing, um, you know, they, they show up later um, and, and watch them in the rerun. So we, we get that. Um, everyone starts off muted, so please um, you know, keep yourself muted because it's so easy to forget that, you know, you're on a webinar when someone walks into the room or something. Um, if you have a question, use the chat um, or, you know, use the chat and just say, I have a question. And then when the time's right, whoever's, you know, speaking will either, either one of us will say it or, or you can jump in there. But um, just, just try to, you know, um, not talk over each other. And uh, let me have a couple announcements here. So, um, this is in this. It's actually funny. It's the first one, at least that I can remember, where I, I actually really screwed up. And I, I think I remember what happened, Jackie. Uh, we the, these two podcasts. Um, we were demonstrating doing a drag and click, um, and we were using BlueStacks, which isn't the default uh, emulator that you're used to using. Um, and so they, the, those, if you remember right, went this. Like we had, you know, quite a time getting them to work right. Well, in the second one. I had paused it at one point because we were still trying to solve this thing. And, and I think what happened was, and I, I vaguely remember this now, I what I had done was I had hit stop and set a pause. And then when I hit record, I hit record to record it into the cloud instead of my computer. And mm -hmm. then when we were done, I forgot that I had to go stitch those two together. Um, and, oh. and, I, and unfortunately now it's gone. So the trail end of how we actually solved this one, which was really easy. Um, however, I do stress you should really consider watching the entire thing because Jackie is live working through stuff and you'll learn a lot of troubleshooting um, of both of us going like, well, what's going on here, right? Let's figure this out. So they, they were much more about troubleshooting than it is about actually solving the thing because the solving of it, you know, we could have done the example in, in like 30 seconds, I think, by the time you got the answer, right? But um, it was working. Yeah, the, the, the method that it, yeah, I expected to work I ended up working. It's just, um, I, did, I actually don't actually remember what the holdup was, but yeah, it was, it was something simple. Right. Um, and then, uh, let's see, there was this one, we discussed, I think, the complexity in coding. We were talking about how, how, how depending on the task you're doing and how complex the, the solution is and what you're working with. Um, and then uh, we discussed, Jackie and I discussed some of the benefits because last webinar, we mentioned the announcement of the HK mentorships, which I have on the next slide. We'll, we'll, I'll explain that here in a second. But what we didn't really do during the webinar was mention how beneficial it is for the mentors, right? We were talking about for the yeah. people that are learning. Um, and this was a good discussion of it's a win-win for both people, right? Yeah. Um, and if you haven't already, oh, actually, I'm going to paste. Let me paste all these in the chat here, in case anyone just wants them handy. And and of course, all of the stuff will get emailed out um, after the webinar, including links to the video. But if you've yet to complete the Auto Hockey User Survey, um, we got another five days um, closing it out. We got a, a decent amount of responses, but I, I'd still like to get at least another hundred. Would be great. So if you're one of those people who haven't finished yet, please, please complete it. Um, we get some really cool this morning. I released a little preliminary look at some of the stuff and it's, it's, there's some really cool stuff in there. Um, and if you weren't here last time or haven't heard of it, there's the, the mentorship site. So this is where you can sign up to both be a mentor and um, get a mentor. 
Um, and here are some of the things that you can say you either want to learn or you're knowledgeable on teaching on. Um, now, for those of you who, who did sign up, um, and there's a few, not a ton, but there's a few, I just haven't had time to go through. I'm sorry. It's a, it's, it looked like it was going to be a manual process, but thankfully I talked to Isaiah's and there's a much better approach to extracting the data. We're just connect. It's all in WordPress, so we're going to connect to the database, um, and so we'll we'll use that to to pull everything out. But then I have to manually look at it and see what people want to learn and see what people know and connect them. But um, if you haven't signed up for again either being a mentor or um, wanting a mentor, it's um, it's a really great thing to to sign up for. And, and trust me, I'd say in the next two weeks I'll have time where I can start getting to it and matching people up. That's great. Now. Um, we're going to jump into a script highlight here. Um, this one I, I happen to stumble on. You know, I so uh, here's the actually let me give you the link to this. Oh, hey, come on, come on, come on. There we go. Um, I'll put it in here. Now I found the original one on the forum, and um, what I wanted to point out is just a couple. This is just part of it. And what annoyed me was whoever this scripter 2016. And I'm not knocking whatever he did, right? Um, but in the code, this is how you called, you know, like, hey, I'm going to monitor for the word apple, and I'm going to monitor for the word banana. And then he used, um, or he or she used them in a go sub to say, okay, when I say apple, do this. When I say banana, do this. But what I didn't like were a couple things. One was every time you add a word, it's adding a whole nother line, which seems kind of silly to me. But I couldn't say, you know, get me an apple because they would have spaces in between. And of course you can't have spaces in the, the ghosts in the labels. Um, so I reworked it just a bit to, uh, to let me show for, uh, is this it? No, that's the screen clipping. Uh, here we go. So um, I reworked it a bit to dump it all into an object and let me launch it. Okay. And now if I say, what is it? Run notepad. There, run notepad. Oh, it ran it a second time. Um, turn up volume. Oh, so it's at 30. Turn up volume. Turn up volume. Now it's 32. So, um, you know, I built in these things. And basically, you know, you go check out the script. Um, I, I, you, you, you would just tie in the word you want, and then you tell it what you want it to do, which is since we're all programming out of hotkey, right, this is easy peasy. Right, you can do here. I have it for turning on and off my monitors. I better be careful how I say that because uh, let me <laughs> um, exit. I just exit out of the script. Um, but it's it's to me it was a really cool functionality and so simple. Um, now, granted, it, it, and it's funny because I when I was making the the video on it, um, and we don't have to go into it now. But um, I had noticed where is it? This there was this on, on recognition was here, and I'm like here's a function, but there's nothing ever calling it yet. I know it works and I couldn't understand. And I was talking to Isaiah's and he, he helped me understand this is kind of like a shell hook or a, a an event listener that is monitoring for. So if I change this to taco, I put taco here and then it would, it would work the same. Um, maybe, or maybe Jackie, maybe we'll do that in a podcast to explain how that works. Um, um, sure. or, or maybe we can do it in a webinar. I think it's a, it's yeah. a deeper topic, but it was, it was really interesting. Um, it was just very perplexing to me of like, I don't understand how in the world it's actually getting into here. No. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I know I say as he raised his hand, so maybe he has something to say. Oh. Well, no, I just had a, um, a question, but I think uh, it, it is uh, the way how you're, uh, in your script, you were pointing to different labels, but basically, is it possible for you to actually run only one label and inside that label um, use if statements, or you are tied to actually running a different label for each um, voice response uh, vo that you're doing? I'm not well, sure. Yeah, with the way I wrote it, it would be, you know, that just jumps down to everything in there. Right, right. But, but I mean, that's how the first guy did it. So when you did the, the change, because you changed it to something a little bit different, right? Um, is it possible for you to, for each of the commands, call exactly the same? Uh, for example, is there a way for you inside the label 
to identify which command actually called it. I, I don't think because you're, you know, you're the, the words that get triggered are going to be the words, but I don't know how you would pass a different parameter because those words have to lead to X thing to happen. Exactly. Right? That's what I meant. So, so yeah. each, each command that actually gets triggered has to call a specific, either in this case, a label or probably or whatever. Function, right. Or what for, whatever maybe, function. What right. you would like, as I asked, is something like a, a this hot key that we have in auto hot key. To exactly. By so which hot key what was pressed. Exactly. Yeah. I, I don't know if he actually built it that way or if the com object actually uh, mm -hmm. allows you to know which was the trigger that I actually did it because that way it would be better to have just one label and then in there have logic to decide what to do based on who called it. But and he's he's doing that in the on recognition function when he says if response text goes up response text. So okay. so he's he's actually using his his well, own that object was, that was to me go to the right Shop. Right. So, so but the, that, yeah. That's what I did, not not him, just to be clear. Okay. Oh, S, yeah, that S was text, you did. Yeah. S text would be the, the string. Yeah, so whatever right. was said, you could act on what was said. Exactly. Okay, so there, there is a way for it. Because it is, it is a very interesting uh, proof of concept, and we could actually um, create something very interesting with it. But what I wanted to know is whether um, there is this restriction in which whatever command you just said has to trigger a specific label or function, or if we could actually map them all to one function and then use logic to actually determine which one to run, you know? Yeah, and that's what it does here. They're all uh, bound to the fun function on recognition, and then the results phrase uh, info get text is used to actually uh, get the text out of whatever was said, whatever was the trick. Oh yeah, I see it. You're, you're talking about line 39, right? Okay, yeah, so, line, line okay, 39. I get it. Okay, there we go. Okay. Yeah, and because the you know you need to say this entire thing, right? So I couldn't say turn on the light or turn on the, I was gonna say record player, look how old I am. Um, you know, turn on the sum and, and say, well, okay, let's jump into turn on the and then change you know, what that next word was because that whole first part is the trigger. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. But you could you could have turn on and turn off as both the different types of triggers and then having the function react to which one, just as you have already done, Joe. You, that's what you have built with your right. labels here. You could just as easily have one that's turned green off and have the recognition function jump to the label that right. would which is what I did. I knew. Yeah. I'm yeah. just saying we couldn't we couldn't do have turn turn off as a thing and then and then have it say, well, use the word I used after that, you know, as the parameter in some way to basically use logic, which is what I think Isaiah was kind of no, no, yeah. I was not. I was. Nope. I was not actually implying that. But well, you said but, use logic to, to make decisions. Yeah, on yeah. So, so, were, right? so, for example, what I meant is like you see in line twenty, you see that run notepad goes is pointing to the run notepad label. Imagine that instead of running to that label, it runs to a specific function, and Can I you, say like, sorry, uh -huh. sorry, I just <laughs> I was looking at the screen and it's just bothering me that I can't see all the code because we're too far. I, I no, that that's yeah. uh, Joe. You have to. Turn a little left. bit to the left, right? Sure. Scroll left. No, no, scroll left. I right, understand right. that. Yeah, I'm trying to. Uh, he said he couldn't see all of it. I was trying to see if I could. Yeah, yeah. Get it on there. yeah no, but it was yeah. to the left. But in general, just imagine that the command run notepad actually points to a label called run. And the turn volume down also points to that same label. But down, but down in the label, you are going to decide whether it was run notepad who called it or turn volume down who called it. Isaias? 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. If you you could just put all these actions inside the unrecognition function, it's already there. Yeah. You would, that, you would do the if based yeah, on the that, S text what, content. Yeah, that's what yeah. Jackie actually explained me, and yeah. he said like, yeah, you could do it because the function actually does that. Yeah. And but Joe is is thinking that I'm I mean like something trying more. to grab part of a, of of the Which command. Which would be interesting, then, in fact. It would be interesting, um, but yeah, that's but, not yeah. what I was. Yeah. Uh, that was one of, not what I was referring to. Yeah. Right. I'm I'm guessing when looking at this code, I don't know where is the p state is is that it's that in the first couple of lines, Joe, where the actual com object is is initialized. Yeah, here. Okay, uh, so so you're. You're doing quite a lot of setup for the word recognition um, object, and then you're using the the method uh, add word transition. There might be lots of other method me methods you can use. Um, so I'd say there might be quite a lot of possibilities here, because you're using specific word rules. You're using a command set word rules states and it just seems like there could be quite a lot of stuff you could do here uh, that would allow you to use the word recognition in different ways yeah it's based on windows uh, voice recognition yeah is it windows, windows 10. Uh, 7 10 no just 10 I just believe. 10 and I, I i suppose that it's it's based on the language used by the user can select if it will recognize french or english or spanish Sure. Yeah. <laughs> very likely. Yeah. <laughs> That's a very good question, actually. I was, I, I did not think of that, right? You know, I don't, the, you know, it's not like it understands the words, right? It, um, and that's, yeah, but the, the way it's the written context. and the way, the way it's written and the way it's understood has to match. Yeah. The same word yeah. can be written the same way, but having two different pronunciations. The pronunciation, right? Yeah. But it's probably built in with Windows. They they did yeah. mention in the post that you know depending on your computer you might have to train it you know Windows might have to recognize your your accent or your voice a bit um, now I don't know if I, I think if I remember correctly that's actually a thing you go into your Windows and say I want to run the training and you click a button and you go th you say some stuff and it it starts learning your voice it's not like it just learns as you use it is my point. No, the, here, if you look at line 11, you have the P listener create uh, Rico context. That is actually the event listener, right? It's, it's used further down in line 27, object, uh, com object connect. That is the one that's actually triggering the recognition. So after that, you use the P context to create grammar. And then you on P grammar, you, you set the uh, dictation set state. So most of these things are probably how fast do you want it to recognize? Which type of grammar do you want it to, to listen for? How do you want your voice? How quickly is it allowed to actually act on what you're saying? Is it allowed to pick words out of your sentence to act on? Stuff like that. All mm -hmm pieces of, of stuff you can probably tweak if you wanted to. So I did, I did a quick search and found a list of languages supported. I post it on the, the chat. Mm -hmm. It's about 10 languages. Nice. Can you teach it words? I, um, I don't, again, I don't think it actually understands the words themselves, right? It's, it's how it's pronounced. I, I did remember at one point you might be able to actually teach it because you can set it to learn your pronunciations. So if the word can be written and then you can teach it how you pronounce it. I, I, I remember seeing a code bit somewhere about that. Run taco candy. Hmm. Run taco candy. Oh, right. So I, I yeah. Yeah, the it, taco candy, what's that? But it hurt it. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's, that's not a thing, right? But it, 
It just uh, the, the program just listens to the pronunciation of those letters right. in the context of the language that you selected. Right. Probably yeah. in this case is by default English, and it will try to match whatever is written to whatever is heard. Probably. Probably, yeah. Here. Yeah. So um, anyway, I, I thought with, with how busy we all are, right, and in, in doing things, and especially where we were doing stuff with the external keyboards and everything, like here's one more way that you can uh, trigger things on, you know, what you're doing. Um, so I, I thought it was a, a pretty slick, easy, uh, e Edolf, it's easy enough for me to look at and to change it. It's, that, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, and I'd say it, it falls well into some of the other parts we've had in some of the other webinars where people have shown how you can use a tablet as an extension keyboard, or you can use our hotkey to build extension, extensive shortcut graphical interfaces. Oh crap, that's right. Um, it, did, uh, it did remind me though that um, <clears throat> when I was using it, that you really gotta be good about, um, I mean, there's a reason why the echo, you have to use the key word at the beginning. Right, because you can very easily accidentally say these things. So having that trigger word, um, it, of course, it would it would always be listening in this program, right? So it's not going to work the way the, the echo does in the sense that you say the word and then your thing. Uh, but I did think about putting the word computer or something at the front of it to help isolate my phrase so it doesn't do because it's you'd be surprised how often you you say some of these things like oh I need to turn the volume down and then it, it does it You're like oh you know. You could probably put that in, Joe. Right. Yeah. Like a prefix. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I would just, I, I'd, I'd want to think of, you know, something because uh, even the word computer comes up, you know, a fair amount of time. But, but still, computer run notepad or computer right. turn volume down. That, good, that good point. Seems that seems to work quite well. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So, um, I, did anyone else have any other questions on that at the moment? Cool. Um, now, Jean had found a uh, list view class that he was going to um, give us a little tutorial on here. I'm going to stop sharing. Yep. In fact, I was looking for. Um a way to do drag and drop inside list view. And um, I had some part of it done manual my, by myself from scratch. And at some point I had an issue because uh, drag and drop, you can also in some point want to drag at the beginning of the list and drop at the end of the list, having a scroll being performed. And doing the scroll was, uh, the, the, the thing too complex and say, oh no, I, before I do that, I'll, I'll search more on the web if I can find something. Someone maybe already did that. And, and I found, found this class from Pullover, which is a, a programmer that is very active on the uh, Autoaki forum that did this class some time ago, a few years ago, I think, uh, LV Rose. Uh, and that improve over time and it, it does drag and drop. So uh, I was pleased to see that and I, I will use it uh, for this drag and drop option. But I found there was a lot more features in it uh, that improve the way you can manipulate a list view inside a graphical user interface in, uh, in AutoHotKey. So um, I don't have a, a long experience using this uh, this uh, class, but I can give you an overview of what it does. And if whenever you need to build a list view and want to do things like uh, copy rows, move rows, cut and paste, things like that, it's all already built in and very well done. So here for the reference, you have the uh, the link and Joe can insert that in the in the deck after the webinar. So the link of, of the, the thread on the auto key forum where the, the class is available and there's a discussion and uh, question answers after that on, in this thread and the source documentation and some example can be download, downloaded from GitHub. And uh, so what it does, uh, an easy way to add functionalities to list view that are not built in uh, auto at key, like 
copy, cut, paste, drag, undo. There's an history. So uh, a little bit like in Word or Excel, you can undo what you've done uh, if you need to. And there's also um, a groups feature that I haven't used a lot, but that, that allow to collapse or and expand part of your list view. So that can be uh, interesting. I, I have no experience with that, but I can give you a little bit an overview of what, of what it does. So uh, the, the discussion is here, the thread on the forum, the GitHub the repository is here. And I'll use an example that I have somewhere. Here, okay. So the, the class itself is here. It's about 1300 lines. Uh, there's a part of it, which is, I would say the public parts so or things that you can call uh, from the, the interface that this class, this class provides. There's a way to create a new handle to an item that will be linked to a list view in, in your script. And then you have functions like, um, I would just go a little, lower here, things like paste, cut. So you can call these functions from your script after you have created uh, the, a class object for this uh, library. So the first example here, I will show you the end result first. What it does, it creates a, a GUI with a menu. I put some content in it. Uh, there's a demo from pullover that uh, use your file uh, a file directory. I just change it to put it in uh, putting it uh, Beatles song. So you have the song name, the album, and the track number. So we have three rows, three columns, and about um, maybe uh, 50 or 70 rows. And what you can do here, you can select. Let's say first I will sort it. So this is built in in the list view. It's not the sort is not part of the, the class, it's built in. But from here, I can say that I will, I will take these three lines here, I will copy them, and I will paste it here, let's say at the beginning of the B, and I will paste it here. So you have the three rows here has been duplicated from these original here. I could do the same to do, uh, to do uh, cut. So I cut these rows and I'll put them, whoops, Put them here, paste. So these three rows here were cut and paste. So you have copy, cut, paste. You have delete if you want to remove lines. Undo will, and I'll do it with, with Control Z. Undo will put the list view as it was originally. So, and even I think the sort was undone, not sure for that. So that's uh, there's an history that you can call each time you modify something using the um, the function of the class. You add a line that will say "Remember this in your history," and when the user select uh, "Undo," it, you it will uh, take the items from the history to uh, undo them. You can use move up, move, move down. And uh, what I'm, I will use uh, in my case, why I, I use that is that you can click on it and drag it. And re when you release the mouse, it will move the item. Uh, in, there's another, uh, in a, a future version, maybe pullover will add something like the control uh, drag and drop like when you use it in a file manager, if you control drag and drop, it will do a copy of your file. So that kind of things that could be added here. But what is, is supported in another demo is right click drag and drop, which is not available here, uh, but that could also allow to say, if I do right click drag and drop, I would do, I, I, I present a menu that would say, do you want to copy the items or move the items or, or depending. There's a, um, here um, a context menu that is also built by this script here that would allow to copy an item and paste it here. So that's the same thing as using these, this menu here. The group menu is enabling to create groups that can be collapsed. So first you have to enable groups. So you have a start here. And let's say that at the beginning of 
at the first B here, I will insert a group. So everything starting here, I can collapse it and close the group. I could give the group a name by programming. So in this example, every group has the, the name new group, but uh, you, could, um, you could give different names depending on how you built your GUI. Uh, let's create a new group here between these two. Insert group. So I have the first group, which is star, the second group, which is new group here, and the other new group here that I created. So it's a nice way to, to, to collapse or expand part of your list view. Uh, how do groups work with sorting? Oh, I can try it. So let's say I will tr sort. I think it sorted the whole thing yeah. group by group. Is this? Uh, it, it seems like it. No, this one is not sorted. The third one is not sorted. Oh. So it's hard to say because all these titles were sorted initially. So if I start over and have the list without the sorting, and I'll create a group from here. Try sorting by the track number would be a little bit easier to track. Yeah, good point. So it sorted the two lists. Yeah, yeah. Sort, sort the whole thing group by group. Yeah. Yeah, which is yeah, uh, well that's done. That's great. Yeah. yeah, that's nice. So I haven't investigated how this is done in the code for the groups, but for this, I can show you how this is built in and how you could use it in your own list view and do things like that in your list view. So, uh, here, John, can you yeah. uh, uh, zoom in just a hair? There we go. Thank you. That's good. Okay. I could not do it with the GUI, but I can yeah. do it with the code. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, let's make it that I'm way. I'm sorry. Before you, before you enter yeah. into that topic, um, did you notice if there's a way to change the name of the groups when you're creating them? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's a... Um, there's a function where you pass a parameter and you, you say what is the name uh, you want to give it. If you want to let the user choose his name, you would have to have an input box to let him type the name he want to use, for example. So there, there's uh, two menus that are built here. So the edit menu and the group menu, and there's a menu bar with these, whoops, with these two menus inside the menu bar. Uh, here it creates the list view. Uh, the list view has to have a name, which is LV1. Uh, the, the class support having more than one list view in the same GUI. So I could show you later, or I can show you right now, that just quick quick look, uh, where is it, like this. So here we have two different list views. Each of them can be used separately. Uh, I don't think you can cut and copy from one to the other, maybe. I don't remember having tested that. Yes, you can. Of course, it's supposed that your tool is you would have the same columns. Right. OK. But it's possible to have so to have items being transferred from one list view to the other. Um, so I'll just remove it for now. So you add the list view. Uh, you create an handle uh, address. You create um, a go sub that will be activated when events occurs in the list view. That's what allows, for example, to detect the drag and drop actions and to act on the on the, the drag and drop. And that's it. Put the here the headers. I'm reading the file, putting the, the data in the list view. And so that's basic stuff that you do with list view, where it's, it starts work being um, LV rows stuff is here. So you have to create an handle to the list view. You could create more than an uh, handle to more than one list view at, at the same time. So in my example, actually, I'm having only this list view, which is this one here. Uh, but if I have the second enable, it would also be considered and, and active. 
you have to set the handle. Uh, add is a function uh, function that is adding into the memory what you do. So it allows to undo these actions. Each time something is done, there's an add command right after just to allow uh, to update the history. Uh, so these two here, I could just comment them out because they are not used, but they can run even if uh, the list view does not exist when I have this commented. And then the uh, list view, the, the, the GUI is shown with its, its list view. I've done some, some tests here, but I'll just first show what was done in the example that Pullover uh, is giving with, with its, its class. Um, there's a context menu here. That's also basic stuff that allow to have the to have this menu being displayed here. There's the LV label, which is uh, activated when you do drag and drop. Uh, first, it's make sure that the list view, the current list view is active, especially, I guess, if you have two list views in the GUI, make sure that's the right one, that is the default one here. And the active list is also um, identified here. And when you do drag and drop, there's an event that will be D, capital D or lower D, uh, that says the uh, drag and drop just began. So for example, when I do, let's say I click here and I, I start the drag and drop, this created an event that was triggered by this um, handler here, and it will, there's a function running, the drag function that you see on the left, line 20, uh, 96, is now handling the fact, that, the fact that I'm moving the mouse. It will insert a line between the items where the drop will put the line that I am moving. And when I release the mouse, it exits this function here. I'll just make this one always visible. So it's allowed to uh, here when I when I drop. In fact, it goes to the next line here, which is adding the drag and drop action in the uh, the in the history, allowing to undo that. And that's the end of the LV label. So this is the LV label is only that is identified here is what allowed to support drag and drops. Then you have the different actions related, uh, associated to the menu item here. So when you select copy in the menu, it will call the, the, the function copy from the class. Uh, no parameter uh, being required here. Same thing for cut, paste, delete, move up, move down. So move up is the word is moving up. I can use control up because he associated also control up. He associated keyboard shortcut to uh, these actions. Undo, it's calling the undo command that will, let's say I'm, I'll just press delete to delete all these items. So undo here will retrieve the items from the history. And uh, redo will redo the, so that's uh, like what you would find in uh, many other applications. Enable groups, insert group, remove groups, all this. I haven't played a lot with that, but that's what we have here. So maybe before going, what I could show you is how you could manipulate things here and make things work your own way. Uh, in addition to what this GUI is showing. Um, and uh, maybe if you wish, we could take a look at the, the, uh, the class itself, if you want to dig in or depending. And the other example here that I can show you quickly, it's not working. It's supposed to be icons here, but I played with that and just messed it, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd at least like to see the, the new, the creation of, um, the, of the class, how, the, how it's initialized. Yeah, so it is initialized here. Yeah, on line 44. Yeah, I'll just put it here. Also. Yeah, so it opens the new handler in the class. 
okay. depending on the n number of least u, it will do this loop one or more time, and that's it. And and the reason after doing the uh, the new, the reason that you're adding the um, the add, uh, yeah, on online. 46 and so on, 46. Uh, 45 and so 46. 46 uh, is setting an handler, I'm, yeah. To me, it's it's like, are, are those four lines underneath that are really needed? Um, I would say that these are not because I have just one list view, but these two here, we can read the doc. So I'm not the developer, so I cannot answer for you. No, I, uh, I invited Paul over to join us. He was not available. So he will see oh. the video of this and maybe he will try to answer, but it will be too late. So too bad for him. But uh, uh, <laughs> I do have a question. Uh, yeah. so, so you see the add function that you have down there in line 46. Yeah. Right? What I was understanding is that the add function, what it does is that adds something into the um, history, history. For, the, for the undo, right? So yeah. you just set the handler there um, do you really need to um, set that into the history? Because that's that's what m might be a, a, a good question there. Maybe. Would I need Maybe. that in the history or not? Yeah, I couldn't tell. So what I can see here, the set handler, select a previously inserted list view or, or add it to the handle. Yeah, that's, that's why I'm saying because you had the new, it, yeah. to me, it seems like it shouldn't be needed to set Maybe. because unless you're doing actions directly after line uh, 47, 48, there, there should be no need for those four. Let's check if it still works. It still works. Yeah. So there may be a reason to use it that is not necessarily used or, or uh, required in this example here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if yeah. you had something that happened before the show, then maybe, but here the set, uh, um, yeah. The set handle it does exactly the same as the new. Yeah. So so by adding HLV1 and HLV2 in the new, uh, you're doing exactly what we're doing with set. Yeah. So this is an example that Pullover did. So maybe you wanted to show how you could add another list view. So if, for, for example, if I put here only this one here, maybe that it will still work because the the LV1 yeah. is added yeah. here. So that sounds check. possible. Yeah. yeah, that seems to be what happened here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, so uh, this one here, I will just use another example that he has. I think that this one here, I will copy it here and open it and run it. So this one is um, using the, um, is display, displaying the um, icons from a DLL file. And here also you can drag and drop things, edit, copy, cut things. And I think that is in this one that it shows that you can do right drag and drop, which is what I'm doing now. And when I release the mouse button, it will ask me, do I want to copy or to move item here? Mm. So that's, um, uh, there's some additional code in this example yeah, uh, that, that allows to, to do that. So I guess that additional code could also allow to do control drag and drop, which would mimic the Windows Explorer, which is something I think would be fine because it would be uh, quite intuitive for users to try control drag and drop. So I don't know if you have questions, if you want to go deeper, if you want to take a look at the, I create some uh, small macros here just to do things by myself, deciding I, okay, I want to take these rows uh, and copy things here and paste it in row number 10. So you can add parameters here. Uh, all the functions that were demonstrated here, you don't have parameters because it, it will use by default the selected row, okay? Uh, but you could also have, this, have things being done without having the user be, be um, having to perform actions. You could do it all by the script and do things like copy, paste, 
or anything like that, just by uh, passing parameters to what rows you want to copy or what rows you want to paste for. And I, what I can show you, which is interesting, is also when you copy something, in fact, the copy command will uh, return two things. It will return the number of, of lines that were copied and the data that was copied. And the data is a two-dimensional array. So let me just try this one here. It will, um, uh, I will run it. I will select three lines here and press Alt-Z. So the message box here tells me that three, I will make it always visible. A nice quick access pop-up feature. Uh, this is the <laughs> advertising. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody mentioned quick access pop-up yet in this webinar, so <laughs> I have to do it myself. <laughs> Joking. Um, so here you have three, that is the number returned here, and you have um, the three lines which from OData, which is three rows, each row is having uh, three columns, one, uh, one, two, three, and the first column being the, um, being um, not the key because it's always the same. Is that the options of the? Maybe. That That's... looks like the options. Maybe. It's the icon and yeah. the check mark, those are usually hidden, but okay. they're there. Okay, so, so, so it's, it's something that is grabbing when he does the copy and it will yeah. he will paste it uh, after that. And you have here the content of the three columns. I, I use the, um, uh, the separator being this here. So that's why you see pipe character between different values. Uh, so that's what is in memory. That was a, when the, the history is capturing these pieces of information allowing to undo things based, uh, based on that. And the paste command here is when I press Alt X, it will paste on line 10. So I, I tell the, the function where to paste. So if I go to line 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So it, will, it should appear around here. I don't have to click there, but it will appear there when I press Alt X. And there you go, pasted starting row 10. So I, let's say I will just make it easier. I'll take all the A, copy them. And I will paste them online. Instead of 10, I will say uh, 50. Oh, I will have to restart the script, so I'll try I'll start again. So all the A here, copy. I could use the copy command here, but I'm using my own macro. And somewhere around here, it will appear. 50 rows at row at, so at starting at 50, where is it? Yeah, here. Are, yeah. Here you have, so it should be line 50, 51 from here, where it pasted the, um, the lines. So it's very easy to use. You don't have to go uh, to uh, like for every class, class. You don't have to understand the details of how the class is done, uh, unless you're curious. But it's using objects and uh, arrays and... Uh, We'll, I'm curious. We'll... I didn't take a look at that, but I'm curious to see how the drag and drop is done because it's interesting. So I'll take a deeper look at that. That's what you have here. Um, before you enter into that, um, I noticed that yeah, that at the beginning of the of the thing, he had kind of like a little index of all the functions that you could mm -hmm. use, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. And those and are for, the public, for each of them. The public... You have the the parameters are are, are documented yeah. in each of them. Yeah. Yeah. But um, the, the one thing that I wanted to know is like, um, those are the public functions. Those are not the internal ones, right? Just, just, those are just the ones that me, myself, I would just decide to use them, right? Yeah, there are internal functions. Of course, you could use them because there's no, no real private function in yeah, yeah. key classes. I understand. But uh, <laughs> somewhere here you have... What I meant is there in the index on the top. The yeah. list on the top does not contain any 
internal functions. Those are all the public functions yeah, that I could Yeah, describe. these your management functions are the in, what oh, we could okay. call Those the, the internal, the internal functions. ones that yeah. he uses. Okay. Yeah. So starting starting here. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm still at the beginning. No, it's wrong year. No. So yes, you uh, get your point. You have these functions here that you right. would not call yourself from outside the, the class. Right. I, I wouldn't need yeah. to use those. But no. this no. is the, the interesting thing. So, so this is something that I would like to point out. Uh, if uh, not many people do this, but this is very useful. When you have a library mm -hmm. or something that good contains many, many, it, it is not really a good documentation itself, but an index of the functions. That's very good because, for example, just for, by looking at this, I know exactly what I can do without yeah. having to go down one by one and searching for each function, yeah. you know? And so you in see here, the, I can just, just, yeah. So I just go here. Right. Yeah. I, I just go here and I know what I can do with it, you know? Yeah. Uh, for example, for the drag, I didn't mention that you can set some values here, like the scroll delay, so at what speed it will um, uh, scroll when you drag, the thickness of the line, that the divider that you see uh, here. Um, I I'm curious. So for... the divider here, the line can be the color you wish and uh, the, the thickness you wish. That's yes, Joe. Awesome. Back at the at the top there, John, and, and this is for for you guys that know what you're doing. So I I, I get your point, Isaiah, is that um you know, how helpful this is. My question is, in the examples that he's given there, like on line 23, would if if you had default values that you you automatically assign to some of these parameters, would you normally put those there, or do you just leave those down? With the function. No, no, no. I, I don't put the defaults there. I just put what you can type. So you see how he said, like, you know that you can auto scroll. I didn't have to go down and look for the function. I just saw it there. And I know that one of the parameters has to do with auto scroll. Now, if you want to set that or leave the parameters or see if those parameters are optional, then just go ahead and look at the function. But at least this index is just for me to know what I can do with yeah. your library really quickly. It just seemed to me... Uh those parameters would just as easily make it available right there. So I wouldn't even have to go look necessarily. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, that, that's, that's good that you can do that. It's true. But yeah. in general, like I, I usually don't need to know the default that you set because if, I'm, if I want to change that, I would change it to whatever I want, you know? But yeah, it's true. If you have defaults, <laughs> go ahead and show what it is. So makes. I'll put red to make it more visible and I'll put 20 to be yeah, this is more awesome, visible. Actually. So so you see the drag line is it's flickering. Maybe there's a way there's some things that are done to reduce flickering. It may be just too wide, but if you want to make it very tinny, so one. I don't know what is the default. So the default is more than one because you see it's very a fine line here. And so the default, if we take a look here, we will see. I'd say he shows that there are, it is optional. So the default um, is two. Right. He uses the annotation of square brackets. Yeah, of, he, he, he of used the yeah. annotation of that they're uh, optional. Yeah. But um, I don't need to know what value, what the, op, the default is, but I know that they're optional because yeah. of the brackets. If and he doesn't the, have brackets, then it is a parameter that I have to actually use. Yeah. yeah. And there's sometimes there's a by ref values also because the function will return an updated content for the, the for example the um, the the copy so this this parameter is is by ref so at the end when it returns it returns the number of lines that were copied and it returns inside this variable what are the lines that has been copied to the let's say the clipboard uh, mm. of this uh, this class um yep Dimitri said we need to make something similar for tree views <laughs> <laughs> i think there is something for tree views actually so I'm not sure when he started working on that. I can check in if there's an history here. Go to, oh, well, on GitHub. Yeah, you can check on the initial commit for that. Yeah, no, just, just, yeah, yeah. just looking first if you have its own history, but 
Uh, yeah. What can you guide me just to find it quickly? Um, the only thing that you have Here. to know is no, it's just a commit history. You see where it says 17 commits? Go back. Go back. Where it says 17 commits on the uh, right? Yeah. Yeah, there. Click on And that. At um, the end of this. Right, yeah. The initial commit was on 2016. 2016, yeah. And it was at the beginning. There, you, if you search on Google, you will find the same library on the old AHK forum. But it's not the, the the current one. The current one is on the new forum. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a, that's an amazing class, Sean. Yeah, yeah, it is. This is where you know, uh, and, and we have. I put the link in there too. If you're if you're new to to GUI's, um, we, we have a, a intro to GUI's course, and the stuff that uh, creating a list view itself is not hard. It's it's all the other stuff that John was just showing. That for me, I'm like, oh my god. Um, like that's just shoot me. I don't want to deal with all that. And <laughs> what a great example of like, you don't have to, right? You, you find someone else that solved it for you and made it simple. Yeah. And there's a lot of good classes uh, on the forum. Yeah. Using uh, SQL light, for example, can be very complex, but there's a very nice class that make it very easy to, uh, to query the, the your database. And yeah, there's a lot of them, of these. So that's uh, if you, unless you have other questions or Thank remarks. You, John. That was yeah. that was, no, that was awesome. Okay, good. Did anyone have any any specific questions regarding this class? Maybe there was a question that we missed. I didn't see. That. I know in Ryan. The chat. It. Ryan, I, I didn't. I didn't see. Look at that. There Jackie. was one with uh, can you reorder uh, the whole group collapsed view. I thought that's why you asked your question, Jackie. So I didn't ask it. Yeah, no, that came a bit after. Oh, my bad. Sorry, Ryan. Do you know, John? What? So Ryan asked, can you, can you sort the, the whole group? Is that what it was? Something like that? We can try. Yeah, we saw that we could sort by the by each uh, row, but probably. So if um, I enable groups and start a new group here and a new group here and i will sort by numbers space. you stop sharing john okay sorry so i have three groups i'll make it larger can i no, I cannot enlarge this example. So I have a first group here, a second group here, and a third group here. If I click sort here, it will sort all the groups in the inside, yeah, separately. No, but but I think the question would be so the what groups was... themselves. You see that the start group is at the top, yeah, and the new group is at the bottom. Probably, if you sort, what maybe he was expecting is that the start group goes down completely. Because yeah. it's the S, yeah. maybe that's not possible. Not in this example. Maybe it's something you could code, but uh, I don't know if it's built in in the um, in the class. There's for the groups you have enable, insert, remove, insert at, remove at. Yeah, he collapse. said you the whole groups in collapsed view. Yeah. So. so, but if I collapse everything, which I can do here, collapse all group. Sorting, there's no sort for the group. These column headers are for the content. They are not linked exactly. to. So you would have to put another command here that would say sort groups but, and, but, do it, but, and do it then with some additional coding. Right, but like. that's the thing. So basically here in, in the in the library itself, there is no function that's not built that. in. You no. would have to do it yourself, which yeah. is this but you is have, cool you have thing, insert right? at and remove at here. That oh, so I could just yeah, I could just use that so to switch them have, around. Right? But yeah. uh, at what row <laughs> here, and so you would have to right. take some time to do that. Do the work. Yeah, yeah, do the, yeah. yeah Sometimes <laughs> you have to do the work. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that, that's a very cool. Wow. But actually, this is this is the cool thing uh, of having the, the the functions right there is that I could just look at them and see. Well, no, I cannot do that. You know, I, I know right. I want to do that. Can I do it? No, I can't. I yeah. would have to do it myself. Yeah. Right. 
Awesome. Well, thanks again, John. Pleasure. Um, yeah, and which John, you know, he he is the author of. Let me um, share my screen real quickly here. Wow, my computer's suddenly running slow. Uh, this is this is my version of Quick Access Pop Up. Um, I have it. You know, it's great because I have you know quick access to a lot of my folders. These are like uh, you know these are I use them as snippets because I don't want to actually open the page. But when I'm posting things like to my videos and people will ask for, hey, do you have a an example of of a you know, um, or how do I get to your intro to GUIs course? That's where I have this built in here. It's just a snippet of code, but you could also navigate to pages, which I don't do too often because I just use my bookmarks for that. But uh, and it does eight million other things, but. That's um, Jean's tool. It's, it's written in AutoHotKey, and ironically, you know, not that many people that use AutoHotKey actually necessarily use it because um, it, it's it's. I shouldn't put it that way. It's just the vast majority of the people using it aren't AutoHotKey users. Maybe that's a better way to, to phrase it. But that's because the people who use AutoHotKey would do that, like they know how to do it. But if you don't, if you don't know how to code in AutoHotKey, then you would need something like this. Yeah. Which well, is but awesome. at the same time, which and I'm going to hit a different hotkey. These these are menus that I wrote years ago, but I wrote them all, you know, line by line, and and it just it took me forever, right? Because it's 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 painful. Um, and so the second I learned about quick access pop up, I'm like, why am I creating my own menus? I mean, it's so easy in QAP to drag and drop and and do this stuff. So that the um. It, yeah, I know how to kind of do those things, but why would I waste, you know, not waste, spend that time when the core functionality, is, and not even that, he has more, because you can add icons, you can have hotkeys associated or hot strings, and possibly someday even voice to tech, like you recognize it, you'll say it, and it'll trigger it. I didn't mention that. Thank you, Joe, yeah. for the commercial break. And, <laughs> um, and uh, yes, that's something that will uh, be, it's on my wish list uh, to add the voice recognition. Yeah, I, I did a, a quick search on, um, uh, we need something like this for three views. Um, I, I, of course, did find something. Um, let me grab the screen here. And fair enough. Uh, if we go here, you can see it's made by Evil C. And it's a proof of concept, so it's not because he finished it completely, but still. So it uh, it's a class made for controlling tree views. And a tree view that looks like this. So I can run it. And it builds this small tree view here. And you can grab an item and you can move it to wherever you need it. You can put it under stuff. You can put it in branches, stuff like that. So Very cool. yeah, uh, that also exists. Okay. You know, it was actually, Jackie, if I remember correctly, it looked like the date there was really close to the same date that uh, Pullover's class was started, it was, it, ballpark wise. It was both early 2016, I think. Yeah, it, it seemed like it, but maybe it's the forum date making this uh, oh fair enough something right that's, right um, yep. close to each other because right. on the old forums it's it's a bit older okay so yeah yeah, tree views, yeah it was just... when you have structure to your data right that's where having a tree view is is really helpful yeah it's just it's it's some nice functionality, and I truly did like actually seeing it done with the list view, like we just saw it. It was just to kind of see if something like this existed, and sure enough, someone had actually done it. I'll stop the share again here. So, did uh, did anyone bring something they wanted to either share or uh, or want help with? Did you want to cut over the the oh, hour? Yeah, thank you, Jackie. Um, now we're done with our commercial break. Let me. Uh, I'm going to stop recording.